Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 523 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. How am I? Doing the best I can given the circumstances but trying to put one foot in front of the other and do the best I can with the time I have available. If it's your first time watching the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like it, subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, four-star review, two-star review, three-star review. I don't care. Engage with the show. Just leave a review. Let people know you listen to it. That'd be greatly appreciated. I've already seen a few on there, and I really, really appreciate those reviews. They really are helping to bolster the image of the podcast from people who look on the outside in. And of course, support for your patrons also more than welcome. Please check out my Patreon at patreon.com for just Agostino. You'll find bonus episodes on there. I already uploaded a bonus episode the other day, um, basically a tribute to um, to Virgil Abloh and everything he did. And basically the lessons that I've learned um, through his journey via working close to him for a set period of time and also from watching him from afar. So if you want to know more my history with that guy and what I got up to, please check out the Patreon. It's really good. And also check out the video that I put out on my YouTube, which was kind of done a bit too fresh, I think. I probably should have waited a couple more days because I don't think I really made any sense. But if you want to kind of understand, you know, what he meant to me and what he meant to culture for my POV, then check that out too. But also check out the Patreon. Bonus content available on there every single week. It's only one pound, the equivalent of one dollar to access all of that content per month tiny tiny amount just to get all that content so make sure you jump on there i'm trying i'm aiming to get to 20 subscribers by the or 20 backers by the end of the year i've already got 10 so if i can get 10 more i'll be over the moon so please check that out i'll be greatly appreciated if you could but yeah here we back are again 523 of the Exynos Singer Show. We're just rattling through them as much as I can. I've got loads of things planned. I've got loads of ideas I'm going to execute in the next couple of days. So if you see a real deluge of content, don't be worried. Don't be scared. I'm not freaking out. I'm not having a breakdown. I'm just trying to make sure that I get everything and anything that's inside of my body, outside of my body. So that's what I'm going to do going forward. But yeah, here we are, man. Back again. Still a bit of a weird situation to kind of, you know, um, uh, digest just from afar I guess because I think you know what it is that's kind of really making me kind of think about this Virgil thing a lot more than I probably should do again because I didn't know the guy too tough we weren't best friends or anything but I had kind of observed him and kind of watched his career from afar and again as with most things when it comes to social media kind of cultural figures you do create or you do kind of build Hmm, create you do kind of cultivate some sort of weird parasocial relationship with people that you clearly haven't met through hours and hours of content of theirs you consume you kind of feel like an odd um, connection to them that's not actually really there so when they do pass it does kind of hit you a lot harder than you actually think it would because you know in reality you don't really know them intimately but you do feel like you know them intimately and obviously because of the small time I had working with him at one of my previous jobs it also gave me a kind of personal and real life context of how he is in person so that was kind of one of the concerns as well but anyway that aside it is what it is but um, I wanted to quickly touch upon it again just for you know again just in terms of me sort of processing it again please forgive me if i'm just kind of regurgitating the same points i've had done in previous videos but i think considering the influence that he had and his larger than life presence and the fact that his spirit will live on amongst all of us and loads of people coming you know and loads of the generation to come actually i think it's kind of just that i kind of do my best to honor his legacy because you know unfortunately i was one of the few people who didn't take time out to honor his legacy when he was around so if that's the case then i'll try and give the guy his flowers you know after he's gone because you know there is no there is um there's no time like the present in that regard but um if this brought me nicely on to heaven preston who put up some really amazing posts regarding his friendship with virgil who he had a very very close relationship with he kind of refers to him as his best friend his big brother all in one mentor whatever all that's good stuff and um, I have an interesting history with Heron as well, considering, you know, I, I mentioned my history with Virgil in terms of my time spent working at that previous company where I was kind of in charge of co-producing a online streetwear program from our up and coming brands. And oddly enough, that course was led by Virgil Abbott at the time. And I just look back on my Gmail, just going through some emails and stuff and correspondence I'd sent to myself and whatnot. You know, I don't think I had it in mind that I was going to hold on to it as an artifact, but just kind of good stuff to kind of know. You know, what's funny. 
when I interviewed for that role that I was um, applying for, it was under the guise that imagine if we did a streetwear program, how would you basically construct it or what would be your idea and who do you think would be the best person to lead it, right? That's what the basically the interview process was. I had to kind of basically prepare a presentation, put together a deck and basically sell myself and my kind of um, ability to construct a salient or to, to construct an impactful um, streetwear program that would give people value in that regard. So me, I went to the drawing board and I basically said, who will be the best person that could kind of encapsulate um, the changing shift of streetwear and fashion nowadays? And back then, I think that must have been 2015, I plucked Virgil out of my head. I was like, you know what, Virgil's the guy. Even though during that time, he was getting a lot of pushback from people in streetwear, you know, a lot of hate for the stuff that he was doing, some, you know, some antics that he did, of course, back then, which were obviously really genius looking back on it, like the Ralph Rugby show and all that stuff wasn't really received too well. But I thought, considering what he was doing, considering he's kind of um, joie de vivre and he's need to be surrounded by all these young kids that were just kind of picking up and doing their things i remember at that time that was when the lucas and the ian connors and all these people started hanging around him it kind of made me think now this guy's definitely got his finger on the cultural pulse at the moment he's he's in tune he's in he, he's in tune on the frequency that people aren't really relating to so i put him down as a person who i think would be great for the program and i kind of basically constructed a whole course around the idea of virgil being the lead curator little did i know that they already were working on a deal to secure virgil as a lead curator in the course which is sick in it so when i did end up working on it it was like a big shock to be like oh my god shit i'm gonna be working with this guy i'm gonna be kind of helping to construct it again it didn't, it didn't happen that way we didn't have a close working relationship because of other things that kind of got involved that didn't necessarily have to do with me but i did have the opportunity to put a lot of these young brands in the same room as him in terms of mentorship you've obviously seen some of those uh, featured on my site sorry featured on my channel um you know and they've gone on to do great things they're kind of killing it high plan of course being one of the big ones that kid's absolutely smashing it now and we got the opportunity to basically place him in the same room as virgil i have given that time to kind of gain that mentorship gain that kind of insight into how he should evolve his brand and then kind of fast forwarding it onto the hair and preston thing back in the day when i was coming up those guys were sort of like i would assume I would kind of relate to them as my peers or people that I was kind of looking at in terms of following their footsteps and the stuff that I wanted to do in terms of being multi-hyphenates, in terms of being autodidacts, in terms of being self-taught and just kind of being a slash, slash, slash person, right? So the idea was like every occupation had a slash after it. So you were a creative director, slash artist, slash writer slash photographer slash whatever event book everything was a slash basically you did everything in all things and that also came from me kind of looking up to people like aaron bondaroff right um formerly of a new york thing formerly of oh wow rec center supreme alumni now doing uh worth doing like all those things were some things that i kind of looked at with those kind of guys and because they were a few years older than me even though at the time i didn't realize i don't think i realized how much older they were um then you know of course due to virgil's un timely passing but i always just assumed we were in the same age range i didn't assume i didn't know that they were like so much older than me at the time which kind of explains why they were so ahead of me at the time that i was kind of looking at them thinking oh my god how can i get them how's he doing that how's he doing this why can't I, why am i doing that little did i know that they had like you know four five years six years on me in terms of experience so that obviously was why they were really going where they were going and kind of you know momentum was building they were all in the same place they were all sharing ideas the binge or things started around the same time it was fucking sick but i do remember back then I was obsessed with Heron Preston's blog. I was obsessed with the brilliance. Um, their their blog, I was kind of following Jound again when it was first sort of like starting. It was just a blog spot. And I had my own blog too that I was running. Um, and I was running it kind of, and I basically, I think at the time, must have copied the entire source code of what Heron Preston was doing for his blog because I liked how he put his blog together and just edited it to make it look my way. And if you not don't believe me, I actually was able to find my old blog spot on a Wayback Machine. So I was able to find an, a, an uh, entry that I did for myself in 2019, the 1st of December. There's a couple more there, I think, but this is what I've been able to find. I wish I still had it. For some reason, I decided to delete my blog spot. I should have just left it. It would have been great, like an archive to kind of look back on and dig into. But I also changed the URL. It sort of fucked it up. So now the blog spot blogger sort of URL is gone. But regardless, this is kind of what I did. And if you remember the old school here in Preston blog you will also remember that this kind of looks very similar so i've got a massive uh, banner here where i kind of uh, coded it so that it would select from random images that i had in my folder on Flickr. do you remember Flickr? Flickr was a site where you could host images and shit we used to use it all the time 
back in the day and I'd kind of have a folder full of banners that I would kind of have rotating um, every time you kind of refresh the page and this one this picture is this actually um, of my feet wearing a pair of bread Jordan 4s I think I got in the pack of the, that 23 pack that sold back in the day if you remember that one I think so the other shoe was a what uh, 4s the other shoe was what a, a 9 was that a 9 a Jordan 9 or something Jordan 9 or 8 or whatever yeah um it came with it but anyway this is me sat somewhere I think in Central Park in New York um you know drinking a, a bottle of Palm Springs or whatever that is it Poland Springs whatever that is but yeah the, the basically the site was following the exact same template that um Aaron was doing and you can tell anyway because if you remember Virgil's blog or Virgil's Tumblr back in the day had the same thing where the the titles were usually um basically the blog was the way we did it back then when we were writing blogs sometimes the titles are basically formed the entirety of the article the story quote unquote you went to write or it'll be a quote or something it wouldn't be like you wouldn't write like a title like oh this day i went to paris and you write the entry you'd write most of the entry in the title itself and then you kind of obviously most of the images are still privated or they're deleted so you can't see them but this is also a feed that kind of rotated images that i had on my Flickr account loads of people um, loads of images of people i took pictures of in church and shit but yeah, this is my blog from back in the day in 2019, or oh, 2009, sorry. I've got my entry here when I went to Birmingham with um, some of the BNTL guys and stuff. ID Magazine buys, um, hauls from Uniqlo, like mad shit in it back in the day. But this is all kind of taken from that era of the Heron and Preston times in it. So when I did see his tribute to Virgil, it did touch me even more so because I, I know from afar how close those guys were. And again, having spent some little time meeting Heron when I went to New York, I think that was what, 2015, 2015? 14 or whenever it was and seeing him around here and there um i know how close they were you know they're really really good friends um so i can only imagine how he's obviously feeling during this time but he did make some really cool post um kind of giving us an insight into their friendship and looking back at some of the key times that they had coming together i just want to quickly go over them so this first one here <clears throat> But again, I'm really, just to say again, selfishly, just for the legacy of Virgil, I'm really, really proud of this little razor that he did in collaboration with Rob from Early Life. Oh, no, it's not his. Okay, that, that's Heron Preston's Rob. Okay, let's just carry on. That's not the same one. But yeah, I am so proud of that though still as well. Heron, um, Virgil did a little collaboration with A Life, with Rob from A Life, and I'm happy that I was able to, during the time working at that previous company, putting a streetwear program together, I was happy that I was able to connect them because I don't think at that time they were speaking. So I was able to introduce them to, to each other and they built a real close working relationship off the back of that time. So that was something that I'm really proud that I was able to do. But anyway, this is a post that Heron Pro uploaded of um, him and Virgil standing somewhere overlooking a canyon it feels like somewhere in LA maybe um, it says here over nearly the past 20 years I was blessed and fortunate enough to call Virgil Abloh my brother my best friend my business partner a collaborator and mentor I love you Virgil thank you for believing in me and pushing me my heart is heavy I miss you so much you are incredibly loved and appreciated this doesn't feel real the past 24 hours have been a state of shock just going on social media and I immediately break down from all the photos and memories so thank you for everyone for the message of strength virtue as soon as i get up there with you we're going to do back-to-back -back sets and i'll bring you a favorite order from kuni toria kuni toriara <sighs> yeah that's tough to read in it man jesus christ i can only imagine what he must feel like man because again as men i think personally especially in the scene because of how kind of you know everyone's got an ego everyone's got pride so to finally find somebody in that scene who legitimately you can call a brother somebody you can say you had a kinship that just went beyond um you know clout chasing something that was actually born of pure love and wanted to see each other build and grow to then see that person unfortunately pass away too soon at such a young age of 41 it must be super hard to deal with man it must be something that doesn't really make sense do you know what i mean in terms of trying to uh rationalize in your head this picture is really interesting at the end i think that's gerard leto kanye jerry lorenzo kanye no, kanye jerry leto jerry lorenzo virgil and heron and i think if i'm not mistaken that must be if i'm not mistaken because again i'm obsessed with fucking vetima that must be the vetima show one of the first ones maybe 2015 17 no no it might not be that 2017 maybe the first one the one of the the most you know the, the one i did like in that really small i think it was a nightclub that must be it i think so but that's an incredible picture to be honest with all those guys and again more pictures of them together hanging out doing the biz let's go through a couple of more of his tributes here um there's a post here again i think of 
uh, of Virgil DJing somewhere at a party they were playing at. Let's see if I can play the sound a little bit for you. Oh, them going back to back actually at DJs. <laughs> And yeah, we took the, we took the or I took those sets for granted too. Do you know what I mean? As in terms of just you know seeing those guys out playing and stuff from, from time to time here and there, whenever they pop down to London, you know, you just kind of assumed you you'd always see it again. So you kind of pass on a few of them. There's a pit. There's a video here of them dancing. He said here in the caption, we had a dance off. I love just to be goofy together. So man. Real, real brothers, man. Real friends, real kinship. Like I said, it must be rare, man. Like, I know for myself, you know, how much I've struggled to, you know, I wouldn't say even find friendship because I, I generally don't try to kind of cultivate relationships. I think I've done really bad in that over my time in the scene. And in general, I haven't really gone out of my way to extend my hand to anybody or to keep up with people and to check in and shit. I just kind of keep to myself, as you've obviously proved, as you've obviously seen with stuff I post. But... It is pretty rare to be able to find someone that you can legitimately call a friend in this thing, man. Again, maybe it's the, it's the way the industry is. It's really doggy dog. The opportunities back then, again, were very slim. I think nowadays there's not probably that much um, infighting because for the most part, if you've got an Instagram and you've got a smartphone, you could essentially build your own empire without having to really lick anyone's ass. And I guess because I had such a bad time coming up and doing my thing and i interacted with a few wrong people and i made some wrong decisions and i went about things a little bit pig-headedly it's put me in a position where i've kind of been i don't know i wouldn't say i'm bitter but i've got a little bit of a chip on my shoulder a little bit tiny hint of resentment that kind of doesn't allow me to open my heart up and to be a little bit more open and make connections with people and try and build and go that way i try and just like lock it in and do it myself which obviously you can't do but you know if there's one thing I've learned about myself over time I need to just learn through just pure pain I can't learn through <laughs> anything else so that's not going to change until I'm really really down the dumps but again it must be incredible for them to have that relationship to have that time again short time but again it was an intense well when the relationship they were able to go from you know scrappy guys doing stuff on laptops to suddenly being employed by two big brands in Virgil obviously in Louis Vuitton hair and now the stuff he's doing at Calvin Klein it must be quite surreal for them both to at the time to pinch themselves and think rah one time we're out here for been you know catting designs online and searching for images on google and the next minute we've got an entire team working for us on these designs and shit it must be sucking fucking surreal it was actually quite cool to see actually virgil bring him in at new guards group anyway in general when that did happen to kind of back his brand and help produce it that was a sick thing to see to be honest that's definitely uh, uh, one part of his legacy again a sick picture of virgil here with his skateboard with the caption that her said can you take a picture of me real quick we've got another one too uh it says here when we hit up tom Sachs to work in his uh, bodega as shopkeepers this was an interesting i remember them posting this on their socials during the time too they worked there as store assistants that was quite cool you know uh the 10 bullets of course there you know that vibe you know what tom Sachs is about and they had a really close relationship too with virgil so i'm sure he must be crying and her and as well off the back of this <clears throat> another caption says i will miss your smile bro we had so much fun together life was always like a movie with you damn 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 yeah he changed the world he changed our lives i remember backstage before this talk i was nervous this is a picture of um heron and Preston and, Vir and virgil sitting on a panel for the forces fashion i don't know who the lady is on the right but it looks like they are allowed to do a panel discussion yeah this is during that time virgil was basically wearing this as a uniform he'd wear this like every single day the same thing that kanye is doing with those balenciaga boots and that leather jacket right virgil would wear a jean jacket in all black every single day of the week it was like his basic uniform. Um, it says here in the caption, I remember backstage before this talk, I was nervous. My palms were sweaty. I look over to that Virgil and he's just on Photoshop working on some designs. I literally seconds before getting called on stage, my man's work ethic was like no other. That's maybe his 10,000 hours too. Apart from being an autodidact, like the time that he spent, because every time you hear people who are close to him in terms of a design fashion thing, they always say he was glued to his phone or his laptop, designing stuff, random things, flyers, this and that, whatever it may be. So definitely... It definitely goes to show that all those hours put into designing merch that didn't even come out, flyers, 
this that whatever definitely led to him going on to obviously build his own brand and then of course get hired by Louis Vuitton do you know what I mean so th that was again one of the legacy that, that was one of the legacy that's part of his legacy I think he's left that I think it's going to give people especially kids coming up you know um, unwavering confidence because essentially he proved that you can do it that way and make it up to the higher echelons of you know Mount Rushmore when it comes or Mount Everest sorry when it comes to this thing that we call culture do you know what I mean and he did it you know he got hired by LVMH you know off the back of you know drawing on trainers and shit do you know what I mean that's a mad mad situation to be in or you know with that kind of um skill set in mind obviously there's um Demna for obviously Balenciaga and Vetema fame standing alongside Virgil and Heron the next one we go along um, them two again standing side by side during the LVMH prize. And then there's an epic picture actually. This is um fashion glitterati really, the mainstays. I think that's Demna with his boyfriend, boyfriend, who's also an artist. That's Lotta, who used to be the former stylist and creative consultant, I guess, for Vetema. I think that should do Mark Jacobs or Mumu, I think. And then that's Gosha Rujinski, who has completely disappeared, it feels like. You know, he went through that time, that kind of weird cancellation period. And then I don't know what's happened to him. Hopefully there's people around him who are uplifting him and giving the opportunity to keep designing. I'm sure he, he's got another brand now, right? Is it called Packbeth or has he got something else off the back of that? I'm not too sure. But there was a time when Gosha was all over the place. He was red hot, man. And then, you know, small cancellation. And it feels like everyone kind of ditched him for whatever it may be. But this is an iconic picture. Another one, at Beverly's Juice. This is what LA Spot with Heron again and Virgil. And I don't know who the dude is in the middle. Uh, a guy called Mark Seekings. And then we continue with a, an, an amazing actually group. This is actually the, the team, the team. We've got the Bintro boys here sat here with Nick Knight. Virgil, Heron Preston, Matthew Williams, and Justin Saunders of Jound fame sitting alongside Nick Knight. I'm guessing at Show Studios, maybe sitting down for an interview. I wonder if this is out. I've not actually seen this. I've not seen this interview or this chat that they had um, speaking together in a circle. Maybe I missed it. I've not really seen it. And you could tell this is back in the day because no, none of them are wearing anything that they're making now. No one looks like they're rich because now they all look fucking rich as hell, innit? especially all these four. They look fucking rich as hell, especially Matthew. He's always shiny. Um, he's always wearing things shiny. He's always looking like he's in, he's, you know, he gets, he, he flipping manicures and facials himself, works out a bunch, drinks, but drinks loads of green juices. This is them being scrappy, consulting, working for Yeezy, doing whatever, you know, I think maybe Heron, if I'm not mistaken, was doing stuff with them. Um, been no what was he doing was he was he working with uh hood by air i think or something along those lines i don't know what matthew williams was doing at the time but again they were all scrappy doing their own thing i mean figuring it out you can get that vibe from this picture definitely this them hanging out show studio walking down i think carnaby street that looks like again you know chilling out doing the london thing but yeah those hats with the oh man those hash those hashtag hats bruv god damn i had those sold so many of those resold so many of those man that i think that hat paid for a couple of being berlin trips again so big up the bin trail boys for launching them and in the last post here um it says here um which a picture of virgil said the speed at which virgil could work and perform at such a high level was freakish i could often i would often say to myself how if he is if he was human i would ask myself sorry if he was human as much as i could observe his craft over the years behind the scenes there was still a mystery to how he managed to do it all he was superhuman he was also a great friend to many he also really made me want to be great of, of a friend as well i admired how he cared so i admired how he carried himself he didn't do drugs he was a responsible family man and loved his kids and his wife sharon and a lot i would also uh, i would always love to see them having phone calls while he would be out because we traveled so much the most responsible it was incredible how he remained focused in the midst of it all always in a good mood he listened more than he spoke he could identify your sweet spot and inspire you to put more gas in that direction he wanted all his friends to win and it was always positive vibes he always remained calm he mastered the art of saying no without saying no seriously one of the most impressive things ever lol Virgil was a warrior inside and out. He put me on in more ways than one and I'll forever be grateful. Truly the most legendary human being I've ever met. My dad said if we're lucky, exactly, it's a good point here at the end. My dad said if we're lucky enough, God put someone like Virgil in our life once in a lifetime. 
his spirit will live on forever oh man that gets emotional reading that man but yeah r.i.p virgil man gone but never forgotten in it absolute fucking legend man absolute fucking legend but yeah let's move on let's move on let's move on move on um so we got some conflicting information regarding this omicron which um which omicron variant which now sections of black twitter are now referring to it as the omarian variant which is absolutely hilarious but there's some really conflicted bits of information that's leading me to believe that we're now in a place when it comes to covid where we just have to make our own decisions as informed adults or as informed citizens of the world we basically have to gather all the information read whatever we can read and decide what we want to do with our lives going forward because if we listen to all these people if we listen to all these governmental bodies these scientific uh, groups and these public health officials we're going to be spinning spinning whilst we chase our tail we are going to have no idea and by the time we look up four five six years will have passed by without us really being able to live our lives and do our things with obviously some precautions and some safety being taken just to wait for their green light because if you're sitting there waiting for a green light from somebody in government to tell you when you should go about your regular everyday life you're going to be waiting forever and this is proof of it so curse your bbc you got one headline that says the following omicron the world health organization warns of high infection risk around the globe two hours ago another article one day ago covid omicron no need to panic says south african minister and if you're wondering south africa is africa they don't know what they're talking about this variant v originated from south africa the health minister of that country is telling us don't worry it's not that big of a deal but in the world the health organization is telling us it's a high infection risk around the globe and if you get it you're going to drop dead so who should you listen to off the back of that who should you listen to i would say listen to obviously the guy from south africa because that's where it originated from and i'd rather hear you guys to say it. but even if he echoed the same force the world health organization the world health organization echoed i still would make my own informed decision and that's where i'm at at the moment which is why i kind of understand the anger that these anti-vax people have when it comes to the mandates being put in place the insistence on all these COVID passports, the boosters. I'm not going to get conspiratorial there and go super down the tunnel in that regard because I think they get a little bit crazy. And I think sometimes just sometimes people in those kind of groups just like just just they just enjoy pissing people off. If you've seen a lot of them during their protests, they're smiling. They're all kind of mischievous trickster type people. They've always got like a rice smile on their face. They love the fact that they're kind of being the minority and pushing back against something that a lot of people have basically lay, laid down and taken with no real um pushback they're happy that they're the ones kind of in they're the ones kind of on the outside looking in and being like nah we're not ready for this thing yet we don't believe you we need more information or even no matter what how much information you give them they're not going to take it because i think one stance i remember hearing from an anti-vax person they were like oh in the beginning i think a lot of them got turned off if, if i'm not mistaken and again i don't know about too much about anti-vax people but if i'm not mistaken most of those people got really annoyed basically because of the conflicting information that was coming out of the world health organization when earlier on they were telling people not to buy masks because they were doing that on purpose to lie in order to save the mask for their hospitals but then it comes out that that wasn't true then you know uh, what's his name fauci was telling people to put mask on and not put it on um then when they when the virus was still spreading they told us beforehand that children would need to get vaccinated and then later on they tell us they do need to get vaccinated then we have all these weird mandates and restrictions that come in place where especially in london or in england for the most part we have this weird thing going on now at the moment where you can go into a pub put a mask on take it off to eat and drink and enjoy yourself but then if you go to a shop you have to keep it on permanently like nothing makes sense it's already intro it's already weird it's already backwards we've tried lockdowns we've tried mask mandates they generally work in terms of maybe stemming the flow of people that go hospitals but in terms of stopping the virus or eradicating in any way shape or form they don't there's not given an indication where it's going to end so i can understand why you're anti-vax i saw I can understand to a certain extent, but I still think that people go a bit too far. But if I am going to listen to somebody about the Omarion variant, I'm definitely going to listen to the South African health minister who said the following. We've been here before, said Joe Fahala. How do you pronounce that? Fahala. Is it Fahala or Fahala? Fahala. I don't know how you pronounce that. If anyone's South African out there, let me know. How do you pronounce that? Ha -ha is it the P silent or is it 
phonetic. I don't know. Anyway, it continues. Referring to the beta variant detected in South Africa last December. Um, South Africa also condemned the travel bans imposed on the country, saying that they will be lifted immediately. The Omarian version has been classed as a variant of concern. Early evidence suggests it has a high-end reinfection risk. This is what BBC are saying. The highly mutated variant also detected in South Africa earlier this month and then reported to the World Health Organization last Wednesday. The variant responsible for most of the infection in France, South Africa, most populated province is Guateng over the last two weeks. The number of cases appears to be increasing in almost all provinces in the country, according to the World Health But I want to hear what he has to say. They kept talking about World Health Organization. What did he say? Um, Dr. Fahala said he wanted to reiterate that it's absolutely, again, see what they did, a tricky BBC. They've got an entire section here talking about how dangerous it is. And then what the actual guy himself said, the World Health, the, the health Minister of South Africa, how he kind of, you know, dimmed down the hysteria, they put it right here. He says, yeah, to reiterate, there is absolutely no need to panic because this is no new territory for us. We are no more than 20 months experience um, in terms of COVID-19, various variants and waves, he added in the media briefing. Of course, that's the guy. On Monday, Japan became the latest country to reinstate tough border restrictions, banning all foreigners from entering from the 30th of November. Wow, you just can't go there if you're a foreigner. Madness. The UK and EU and US are among others who earlier imposed travel bans on South Africa and other regional states. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said he was deeply concerned about the isolation of the South Africa, adding that the people of the Africa cannot be blamed for immorally low level of vaccinations available in Africa. But yeah, cool, whatever. Like I said in the, in the beginning, you have to make your own decision as an informed citizen of the world. You can't be waiting for these guys to give you permission to live, exist and do your thing. Um, make whatever decision that you need to make, whether it's you staying at home, whether it's you getting a vaccine, whether you're getting a booster, whatever you want to do, do it. But just try your best to try and get as many news sources as possible, as many bits of information and just make your own mind up. Because unfortunately, these people that we've put into government, these people that we voted for generally don't know what they're doing. And it feels like, it feels like to me at least anyway, they just don't want to relinquish any, any semblance of control that they have in our lives where they're able to dictate to us when we can go on holiday, when we can go outside, when we can club, when we can eat. It's just really ridiculous. And if that's the case, then I'm willing to take my chances on my own, to be honest. Moving on with that, um, we've got an interesting development. Da, 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 da. Oh, should I talk about that or not? Now, let's just move on to that. Let's, who cares about her? So moving on from that one, we have interesting development courtesy of Jack from Twitter. Jack Dorsey has officially stepped down from his role as CEO of Twitter to pursue other ventures, it feels like. So he posted this on his Twitter account fittingly um, with a kind of, you know, sarcastic caption, which said the following, not sure anyone has heard, but I resigned from Twitter. Just came pretty, completely out of the blue. I don't think anyone really heard or anybody knew. He definitely kept this close to his chest or only told a small group of friends. But regardless, this is what he said. The subject line is fly. It says Jack Dorsey and is obviously posting it to the entirety of the team. It's interesting to see that they actually use Google um, as the email client. I don't know why I thought they'd use something different. But anyway, let's just continue. He says here in the email to his team, screenshot that he's taken and put it up on his account. He says, after almost 16 years of having a role at your company, from founder to CEO to chair to executive chair to interim CEO to CEO, I decided it's finally time for me to leave. Why? There's a lot of talk about the importance of the company being founder led. Ultimately, I believe this is severely limiting and a single point of failure. Um, was that okay? I've worked hard to ensure this company can break away from its founding and founders. There are three reasons I believe now this is the right time. The first is Parag becoming our CEO. The board ran a rigorous process considering all options and unanimously appointed Parag. He's been my choice from some time now, given how deeply he understands the company and its needs. Parag has been behind every critical decision that helped turn the company around. He's curious, probing, rational, creative, demanding, self-aware and humble. He leads with heart and soul and is someone I learn from every day. My trusting him as CEO is bone deep what a resounding flipping endorsement that's a great fucking reference isn't it imagine if one of your references because I, I, I've only got good references lately or in the last few years because I've obviously I've worked in better jobs and I've been able to cultivate better relationships because I've gotten older because I'm not being such a cunt as I was beforehand but when I was a cunt back in the day I cannot imagine asking some of my former managers for fucking references and if they did trust me they wouldn't sound like that 
It continues. The second is Brett Taylor, agreeing to become our board chair. I asked Brett to join our board when I became CEO and he's been excellent in every way. He understands entrepreneurship, taking risk, companies at massive scale, technology product, and he's an engineer. All of the things that the board and the company deserve right now. Having Brett in leadership role really gives, um, sorry, really leadership role gives me a lot of confidence in the strength of our board going forward. You have no idea how happy this makes me. Again, a great reference. The third is all of you. We have a lot of ambition and potential on this team. Consider this. Parag started here as an engineer who cared deeply about our work and now he's our CEO. I also had a similar path. He did it better. Again, resounding endorsement. Mate, that's probably one of the best lines to basically describe why I decided despite all his flaws, despite his headaches, despite the stress, despite the anxiety, despite the self-doubt and all this stuff that happens when you work in that industry, why I decided to pursue a career in startups and kind of pivot away from the fashion thing that I was into and just kind of enjoy that as a consumer, enjoy that as a fan, enjoy that as a creative on the inside, but not wanting to work in it because at the time when I was coming up, I really wanted to be a part of it, work for a magazine. I remember kind of um sending intern emails to like 032c when i was in uni and industry and um what else i sent emails to no not industry i didn't send it to 032c um what else is it? the i forgot magazine i also considered Maybe CR went imagine when they first launched Karen Rutherford fashion book, maybe. But anyway, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be involved in that really badly. I was obviously working in a cool Nike shop. But then there came a point where I was like, you know what? This isn't the place for me because it's going to make me required to do some things that I just can't do physically. You know, lick people's ass and whatnot. Um, you know, pay my dues. As somebody annoyingly said to me back in the day, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to do the thing. So the only way I wanted to do the thing is obviously to go somewhere else. So I decided to go into startup realm. And that's what allowed me to then kind of build up my career, build up my CV and kind of have some really interesting experiences working for some great companies. And um, yeah, that's the reason why, because you have the possibility to basically go from being, as he's mentioned here about the Parry guy, being an engineer all the way to actually working up as a ceo you know because you have you wear so many hats working in startup you know you you, you you go in there working wanting to be a content marketer and then suddenly you're doing sales suddenly you're a copywriter suddenly you're producing yeah you know i mean it's all amazing and then you take that experience and you apply it to other places too anyway it continues this alone makes me proud i know parag will be able to channel his energy best because he's lived it and knows what it takes all of you have the potential to change the course of the company for the better i believe in this with all my heart again inspiring words isn't it you can tell why he's so successful isn't it? He, he sounds like a great leader despite everything that people say about him like legitimately he sounds like a good dude off this email like you can you can feel the vibe you can feel the rah rah imagine he's all hands Oof. making me making me a bit wet anyways continue here he said parag is ceo starting today i'm going to serve on the board through my term mayish to help parag and brett in this transition and after that i'll leave the board why not stay for or become a chair because i believe it's important to give parag the space he needs to lead and to back my previous point i believe it's critical the company can stand on its own free of its founder influence or direction i want you all to know that this is my decision and i own it it was a sorry it was a tough one of course I love this service and company and all of you so much. I really sad yet really happy. There aren't many companies that get this that get to this level. There aren't many founders that are choice at the company over the years and my ego sorry, there aren't many founders that choose their company over their ego. Um I know we'll prove this uh was the right move. We'll have all the hands on meeting tomorrow and da, 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 da. PS I'm tweeting this email. May and my wish is for Twitter Inc. to be the most transparent company in the world. Hi mum. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting aim. But yeah, cool to see. I'm interested to see what Jack also ends up doing as um, his own career going forward. Um, does he just kind of, you know, double down on, you know, doing cash app and all that shit? Um, or does he start something else? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. But then it was an interesting way for them to start the new era off the back of all that, right? Um, they then announced straight away well, after Jack Dorsey posted that post, Twitter posted this on their safety um, account, they said the following, sharing images is an important part of folks experience on Twitter. People should have the choice in determining whether or not a photo is shared publicly. To that end, we're expanding the scope of our private information policy. Beginning today, we will not allow, you will not be allowed to share, so we will not allow the sharing of private media, such as images or video of private individuals without their consent. Publishing people's private info is also prohibited under the policy as it's threatening or insensitive others to do so i don't know how they're going to police pro, uh, police that i think after the post a lot of people were posting you know images of the new 
Parag guy, some guy quote, posted this quote here, said the Nazis had a phrase which covered all the abuses by the state. It said it's for your safety. That's how they basically justified all the abuses. <laughs> so people are describing Twitter as a former Nazi regime, which is, I think is a bit too extreme. Um, I think people posted images of Parag himself, the new um, CEO, um, profile pictures of him, obviously, because, you know, they, they, they are... It, in, you know technically those are private bits of flipping um media that obviously people don't own that they're then resharing so it's a bit of a rocky start again give the guy a chance um i'm sure there's a reason why they're going in this direction if jack dorsey believes him who's way smarter than any of us guys then i'm sure this guy will do a good job but again he needs to give him the opportunity to kind of breathe and do his own thing let's not kind of all kind of get down his throat i don't think that's not really beneficial um, let me drink a bit of this green juice that I'm having here. So good. Anyway, continue on. Interesting article courtesy of Business Insider, right? Um, called uh, Inside the Rise of Anti-Work, a worker's strike that wants to turn the labor shortage into a new American dream. And this is something that's not just limited to America. I think everywhere in the world, especially parts of Europe, especially in Europe, yeah, especially in Europe where... Um, you're able to get a lot of money from the state or from the government in order to allow yourself to kind of live and not need to work. There's a lot of benefits out there. <coughs> I look at places like the UK, places like Germany, places even like Spain. And what's essentially happened during the COVID, again, because of COVID, like um, unintended consequences, it seems like this entire time that we've all spent locked in at home, um, locked down, restricted, not able to do the things that we enjoy, we've kind of decided or we've kind of figured out that maybe the work that we were doing prior to COVID, the, you know, 60 hour work weeks, the crazy retail shift, the crazy bar shift that were just giving us just enough to kind of keep up our head water wasn't worth it in the end. And people have now basically um, formed new habits formed new ways of living day to day that doesn't necessarily require them to be busting their ass over a kitchen counter or over a stove you know in a bar somewhere in a shop working an entry-level job in an office it's not worth it for some of those people especially the ones who decided to leave densely populated metropolitan cities for maybe places in the country where they're not paying as much rent they're not maybe as paying as much on their mortgage they maybe don't need to pay so much on their travel which is then allowing them to do other things whether it's kind of you know as Joe Rogan would always say when people start doing podcasts, like, you know, you open your own workshop and you start making custom knives or whatnot, whatever it may be, whatever hobby that they're into, um, they're deciding to pursue that as opposed to pursuing the employment thing because they know, especially in America, when it comes to the American dream, there is no such thing as an American dream tied to an employment working in McDonald's. It just doesn't work. If anything, it's just one way. McDonald's are exploiting you for your labor. And even though nowadays, I think McDonald's are putting up loads of bits of advertising where they're basically saying that they're willing to pay people that want work that up to $20 an hour but for some people that just isn't enough and I think there's a lot of people in that anti-work movement who are trying to push for this kind of um um what do you call it ubi universal basic income or something similar to what we got here in the uk in terms of universal credit where the government can you know cover your rent up to a certain amount cover your living costs up to a certain amount and you just got to make up the difference whatever you need in order to kind of function and whatnot and it works to a certain extent because some people are able to survive and get by with that entirely but in other countries such as america where essentially you are forced into a position to work in order to kind of you know basically pay your way through life and to ensure you have the ability to look after yourself and to pay for stuff like health care and whatnot um it's definitely must be eye-opening but i'm definitely intrigued by the whole premise around it but then on the other side i'm also very aware that work especially for myself i've come i've i've come at a weird position because you know i've got entrepreneurial dreams i've got creative dreams i've got really big ideas really big goals delusions of grandeur when it comes to the stuff i want to do in the future and i've always had this i've always been like this since i was you know 10 years old or something and i kind of first saw you know documentaries online about certain artists or certain design studios i always kind of went to kind of go out and do my own thing but through just lack of you know preparation um foresight uh, procrastination fear whatever it may be i just never have taken a step until maybe this last few years where i've obviously started doing nights i started djing i started obviously doing my podcast i started recording i started doing zines that i've kind of self-published and whatnot right i decided to do loads and loads and loads of things but it doesn't matter somewhere there there's loads and loads of things only in the last few years and but i've also realized too over the years how important it is to be able to have some sort of employment again for my own from my own um point of view 
I found that having a job mostly obviously allows me to have a set a base level of income that's going to sustain me and it also allows me to use that money to fund all my creative projects and the aim has always been for me to use the employment luck as an opportunity to fund a creative project and then if that creative project takes off then you could quit your job but this idea of just kind of not working completely and only focusing on a creative I felt like put too much strain put too much pressure and also wasn't realistic to what actually is required for you to kind of pop because no one knows when you pop no one knows when you're going to make it no one knows when that next stage is but you just need to be ready for it so the best way to be ready for it would be to have some sort of job that gives you some level of a base and then just supplement it with other things until you kind of get to where you want to get to i know that opinion is kind of different to some people because i've got friends who are a little bit not they're not on that vibe at all they'd much rather work for six months save that money and then use that money to live for another year or eight months and try and make their dreams happen that way and then rinse and repeat but i just don't think that it's got a viable way and i think again i get a lot of satisfaction as well from having that structure having that you know need to be even if i'm working from home now i need to still be on my laptop at a certain time i leave at a certain time you know i'm cognitive of being a good member of part of the team of providing great service and whatever maybe right I, I, you're really aware of that that and i feel like that goes into informing how i work on my own things outside of that i felt like whenever i didn't have that anchor i always was a bit like too freestyling a little bit too you know wishy-washy and definitely really got done but i've always found that if i'm working especially at the time when i was djing you know from Thursdays to sundays most weeks before the pandemic i found that working from nine to six really gave me a superpower in terms of getting through music preparing playlists putting stuff on usbs um you know whatever thinking of an outfit whatever didn't matter but because i had such little time if i finish at six by the time i get home it's 7 p.m and i have to make sure i use the time that i have before i go to bed at 12 or not to get as much as i need to get done before the set on friday whether it's downloading things retagging it putting it onto usbs again thinking of an outfit designing the flyer for the night whatever i had to do it all in those times and i think with that time of having a job that's why i did it i think if i was just able to kind of wake up when i went to wake up i probably wouldn't get around to doing it and i'll be just like one of these other lazy bums or lazy you know creative types i just kind of talk a big game and again at my level you need to have that little bit of a work ethic that regard but anyway that aside the anti-work movement is here people's eyes have opened again unintended consequences of covid let's go through the article it says the following um larry had a vision after graduating college um he and his then wife were going to be a power couple they were going to actualize their american dream they'd buy in a house in the suburbs and go on vacation every two years that vision of the perfect life eventually shattered his then wife saw through the illusion of work he said and quit to take care of their children and her elderly father it took him a little longer to get there his quote is something that some is something that someone else planted in our minds larry whose last name is known to the side now larry 52 doesn't work by the time the pandemic hit he was ready for a change he left his job as a maintenance technician in south carolina to be with his ex-wife and children in colorado he then got laid off from his seasonal job there he moved back to south carolina to be with his mother he now lives simply in a 20-foot trailer in his in their backyard okay they're not selling in this too much in it right this guy lives in a trailer in his mum's garden at 52 years old i'm not too sure if this is a good advertisement for anti-work but let's continue <laughs> he says here i really don't have any expenses i don't need any money i can survive without money he says okay interesting larry's part of something that's growing people who are opting out of working some of them call it anti-work it's a trend bolstered by young workers as gen z's make their mark on labor market in america it looks similar to a similar uh, youth-led movements against the work in other countries especially china where young people are laying flat by this decentering a drive sorry by decentering a drive to constantly be productive and competitive at work and instead find happiness in their own lives and relaxation you know what's funny about this anti-work monarchy it reminds me a lot of um four hour work week by tim ferris which i still think is a hard and bad rep that four hour work week by tim ferris opened my eyes to the idea of living a location independent lifestyle of having a muse a business that basically generated you um passive income as people will say on these fucking self-help videos you see everywhere but that was a game changer back then right the ability to have a little marketing business where you basically free sorry where you basically outsourced all the customer support bits to places like the philippines or india and it basically allowed you the ability to travel in parts of the world and kind of hot desk around in places i remember when i went to nicaragua to travel 
all that time bumping into a guy in a hostel big up bruno he knows who he is um who was very coy and very kind of secretive about what he was doing but essentially that's what he was doing at the time he had a muse he had a little small business that was generating in passive income he was able to do his work um remotely too freelancing whether it was translating whatever he was doing and it allowed him the ability to kind of rent a beach hut on the beaches of nicaragua just chilling you know eating drinking flipping coconut juice and chilling out and smashing tourists and stuff do you know what i mean he, he lived a fucking bad life and i really wanted it at that time people were being secretive and didn't want to tell you what it was about but essentially it's the same thing and people gave you know the four-hour work week a lot of stick because it was a four-hour work week you can't get anything done in four hours but the whole idea the premise about it was effectively not to only work four hours but it was to in decrease the amount of times you're working so that you can actually do the things that you enjoy to do but i think in this modern age or back then especially what you realize is that people don't really have hobbies they don't really have things to do which is why they love work so much and i've been in companies like that where people in the company legitimately are good friends they invite each other to weddings and shit they go on holiday together they are the godparents of their flipping kids you know what i mean they legitimately have a connection that's deep because you spend six seven eight nine ten hours with these people every single day five days per week sometimes more you probably see them more than your actual family members so it's no surprise you have a real close connection um but that's what people basically live for day to day they complain about it but they live for it so when someone tells you hey here's a four-hour work week it's going to allow you to have more time to do the things that you actually enjoy doing and not be at work all the time they're going to be like i don't know what else i have to do though because everything i do is in part with work whether it's going to drink it's going for dinner going on holidays going to the theater it's all tied to work because the ideas come from work so that's basically what you basically end up seeing it was more so people's insecurities and oh i think i think yeah the pushback on four-hour work week had more to do with people's insecurities about not having hobbies to do in in their adult age as opposed to the premise of the book being bad or being ill-advised or being um not productive or anything i don't think that's the case anyway continue quote i don't really want to work anymore larry said I don't want to have any meetings, no deadlines, no goals, no quarter, no seminar. I don't want none of that stuff, which I don't blame. You know what I mean? There's nothing worse than a meeting about a meeting working in a company. I think that's one something you only learn once you actually get a first office job. I remember for me when I was working in bars and, you know, clubs and stuff and fucking um, shops, you would always long to be in the office because people, especially working in retail stores or high-end fashion stores, just stores in general, you'd always have people coming in for marketing, um, people coming in for merchandising and floating around the shop and moving things around and just pissing you off because you know they don't give a shit because they don't work there they're just there to fucking change some posters but you always long to be that person that was able to come in with the coffee in hand work in the office and then when you do finally work in the office you realize that the same politics and the same bullshit you experience on the shop floor is the same in the office maybe sometimes worse right there's not a lot of people actually talking there's, there's a lot of people talking behind the back when it comes to offices let me tell you that in that regard you really have to make sure you get in there and make some good allies because it can get really sticky really quickly it continues um a rising disillusion with the state of work has spawned millions into larry's um over the last year people have been quitting their jobs at record rates for six months in a row now and many aren't going back that's true because i think the same thing happened in berlin when i went they're really struggling to find staff you know be barbacks and all that stuff and people just working in around i think that's why i mentioned it before one club i think in munich blitz said that that's the biggest struggle that he's had not opening up and having people dancing it's actually finding decent staff no one wants to work um that's already told you about the adidas so mcdonald's advert that they're putting out now mcdonald's has to have this weird advert really funny where they basically got like a yellow poster and the mcdonald's yellow and they basically printed um one dollar bills to represent every bit basically to represent how much money you're going to get paid per hour and i think it was twenty dollars in there on this thing and people are still don't give a shit you know what i mean mad um so I said that that's because some of some work doesn't seem to be worth it anymore wages have been in a decline for decades uh, while student debt rises the number of pe people with low level wage jobs has grown since the great recession as salary support and middle class life have catered so again caught in a weird place um then came the pandemic billionaires added 2.1 trillion to their collective wealth as millions of americans were unemployed the inequality of the world is mad in it the billionaires get richer and the poorer get poorer um the stories of those in the anti-work movement provide some answers as to why there's an ongoing labor shortage it says the following a million strong and growing the reddit group anti r such anti-work has garnered a million followers it first began in 2013 okay half of those joined just in october 2021 and 
and it means that tens of thousands of people, if not more, visit the group daily. As expressed on subreddit, anti-work is about embracing a work-free lifestyle and finding community and pushing back against exploitive working conditions. We can get behind that. Again, you see the graph of many subscribers. A quote here says a lot of people mistake anti-work for being lazy and like nothing has ever got done. One moderator on subreddit who goes by um, whatever he says there. Um, but the truth of the matter about anti-work and everything surrounding it is that obviously things have to get done. But the structure in which uh, things get done and the way the capital flows as they get done is unfair and should be non-existent. We should definitely agree. But people, some, someone has to work still. That's the problem we all can't be anti-work someone has to get stuff done but it's just a dip it's just the insistence that if you don't work you die that's the issue right if you don't move you get eaten right you, no, no 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 that can't be how it goes it goes here again k the gen z worker in kansas is one of the people who turned to anti-work and posted after he quit his job as a service worker he had been considering quitting for a while but he was pushed over the edge after his boss posted a message telling workers that they couldn't use their phone during shifts and if they were caught on their phones management could confiscate them okay that is a fucking bullshit work job and that's a bullshit boss imagine working in a place like that off the back of a pandemic and your boss is stressing out of you working on the phone bro you're lucky we're even in here do you know what I mean relax he continues he says i never really see anybody not doing work on their phone kate said he added that he didn't think management should have the right to take his personal property kate said that he first started seeing posts from anti-work a few months ago that reading people's accounts of quitting and learning from about the ways that they're rethinking work factored into his own decision to quit. He's already had at least one interview for a new job and has a little bit of savings built up to keep him afloat in the meantime. I think it felt like I'd be a lot bigger part of a movement. I didn't want to put up with that stuff. It's also where Caitlin Nickerson, a fellow Gen Z, would post after she quit her job in the first service to pursue woodworking full time. Again, great to see. The table's a bit shit, but you know, it's great to see. Um the group helped see her um the group helped her see that it's not she's not alone and she had four issues about understaffing and long hours were just at her workplace. She quotes, I realise that there's happening everywhere. Companies are saying, Hey, you know, there's a labour shortage but they're not hiring people and they're just overworking their current employees. I think that's not that's I think that's good to know that that you don't have to take that. According to Nicholas Nicholson, sorry, Nicholson he told her boss he couldn't work on a certain day because she needed to bring her um, car in for the repairs. Her boss said if she didn't show up, she'd be fired. She didn't show up. Yo, who are these bosses that people have, man? Fucking hell. Hell fire. What awful people. Focusing on woodworking has been fulfilling. She said people used to actually build their own stuff and do a lot of stuff at home. I think that stuff isn't really appreciated as much anymore and it should be. Like many aspects of the economy, the rising sentiment against working and conditions create that. Yeah, let's not really wish whole thing is too long. But yeah, you get the point, right? So where do you stand on this anti-working thing? Would you like to be an anti-work person? Do you still think work gives you some level of purpose and direction? Um, are you like me and you like to use work as a kind of leverage or as a kind of bank in order for you to kind of put money into other things that you want to do? Or do you just not care? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts regarding everything on that one moving on we have an obvious headline courtesy of dj mag police presence at music festivals increases chances of panic overdosing study shows oh really does a study tell you that this has been one of the main things that's really pissed me off about the uk nightlife industry in general um the approach the government take to it the approach the police take to it and just in general how that's basically affected the way we are um so fucking intense when it comes to going out and it takes us so much time to kind of get that um need to get absolutely f plastered out of our system it takes a while before we visit places in the continent visit places around the world before we start to realize that maybe you don't need to be cramming and spilling and pouring you know buckets full of alcohol into your flipping throat before the hours of 12 just so you can get the discount deal or just so you can run away to a club that's going to close at 2 a.m you don't need to do that and again when you go to festivals sometimes or when you go to clubs and parties and you're already super smashed you maybe want to you maybe have taken drugs already and then you've got a flipping yellow jacketed fluorescent fucking security guard walking through the dance floor with a flashlight on making sure they're checking everyone and seeing that you're not doing anything untoward and then someone next to you gets absolutely yanked out of the club um by their flipping collar and you've got something in your hand what you're gonna do you're probably gonna chuck it all in your mouth so you don't get in trouble but that might also lead to some um bad trouble for you especially for you know 
personally we might end up dying off the back of that shit and that's all because of our flipping draconian um draconian laws concerning drugs and whatnot but anyway what's the study say it says here a new study carried out by australia has found that the presence of police at the music festival can lead to some attendees panic overdosing i definitely agree with that one i definitely know that could happen because i know how bad it is already with the drinks by consuming all their drugs prior to entering the site the study led by Re exactly because i went what festival did we go to one festival it might have been junction two junction two was good once you got in sound i said it was amazing great organization but if i'm not mistaken before you went into junction two they had some security guards basically on the road the street before you get to junction two looking at people as they're walking down like you know i guess there were stewards and chaperones but basically security guards like you know and then before you walked up to the gate to kind of go in they'd have like a security doing this like peacocking i mean sorry like a meerkat checking the, the sea to see if you made the movement if you went to stuff something in your underwear went to stuff something in your sock they'd be checking you from that far away already it's like come on man you guys are intense if you find the stuff where else i get there fair enough but don't be doing with that innit? that's too much it continues here he said the study led by researchers in the university of nsw surveyed festival goers at six music festivals in north south wales that took place between november 2019 and march 2020 researchers asked 100,229 participants to complete an anonymous survey around drug use habits their intended drug use at the events and how police and the drug detection dogs influence their drug use at festivals they were attending of the 1,229 respondents, 372 said they had used or planned to use drug at a festival they were attending. Among that group, MDMA was the most popular. Makes sense if it's a, if it's a, if it's a fucking um, festival with 260 out of the third of the 372 people saying they planned to use a drug. Cannabis, cocaine, LSD and ketamine were used there also recorded. Most importantly, researchers found that there were a correlation between the presence of police, drug detection dogs and high risk drug behaviors among uh, festival attendees. Participants in the survey said that the presence of police and police dogs influenced their decision to take drugs and said that they were twice as likely to preload, meaning that they would consume all their drugs before entering the festival grounds through fear of being caught in possession of illegal substances. The presence of police was also found to make people reluctant to seek medical help according to so Of course it was. Because it's not grown up. You know you're probably going to get snitched on. You know you're going to get in trouble. The preloading of drugs is insane. I'd much rather have myself nicked and taken off me than preloading. That just sounds like a mental thing. But I guess it's something that you do if you're really young. You definitely have the resilience and probably the ability to do that and consume so much. But again, it's still playing with fire. Um, speaking to The Guardian, Dr. Jonathan brett a senior research fellow at the university of nsw who was also the study said there's a really growing body of evidence now in australia that police and police stock presence and security um as strategies at festivals is actually pretty harmful um which of course we already knew i really hope we can have a conversation um not about not about removing police altogether but potentially about the different approach to policing strategies that isn't just about criminalizing drug users everyone wants people to be safer and healthier so we need to discuss how we can best achieve that okay definitely agree with that but yeah this article definitely just goes to prove everything that we know already going out is definitely true um these police dogs the laws again the drinking laws the licensing laws whatever is including at the moment there's also play a big part the fact that in some towns especially smaller towns outside of london clubs close at 2 a.m sometimes even earlier but the pubs close at 11 but the pubs have got all the deals the pubs are people where people go and pre-drink they go and pre-drink and then they bounce from there and then go to a club until 2 a.m but then that's not long enough even for to actually get into the groove and party so you're then of course then getting super smashed and by the time you get chucked out of the club at 4 a.m you, you know you, it'd be a miracle if you still got your wallet and your keys on you because you're just complete mess whereas you go in places in the continent and places stay open until 8 or 6 a.m to the next day it makes you a little bit more calm and cool because they open at 4 they close at 6 there's no rush you can go there straight away you don't need to go and drink in the pub to go there beforehand you can just enjoy the day and leave when you want some places are open 24 hours but kind of basically until the next day until the following afternoon it just gives you time to enjoy yourself and get chilled of all my time going out to places on the continent i've legitimately never seen people moldy drunk than i've seen them here in the uk on every any given day over there it's just not a thing people are just a little bit more used to how knowing how to pace themselves but again most of it has to do with the fact that their pubs bars off licenses even look at the spetties they have in flipping um 
in Berlin and whatnot, some of them are open all day. You know what I mean? Especially in certain areas. They're open fucking all day. You can legitimately party out there if you want to. Just outside of a shop and whatnot. So all those things definitely contribute in my opinion. But hey, will they change it? Will it move? Probably not because, you know, we just live in a place where everyone wants to be anti-fun. I guess like, I don't know. It's just annoying when it comes to all that sort of stuff. We move on. What you want to talk about here? Um, yeah, let's move. Let's 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 uh, move on to a couple of other bits and bobs I wanted to speak about here. Mm. Let's talk about this. So it looks like people on the internet, um, specifically people on techno Twitter, are really pissed off with um, Jeff Mills because he's agreed to DJ at a festival in Saudi Arabia. You know knowing Saudi Arabia, knowing M MBS and obviously the accusations against him, you know, assassinating and killing journalists, one being um what's his name, Jamal Khashoggi, who is the feed who is the kind of um who's been documented in that what's that documentary called? The Descendant. Remember that one that came out recently? I think there's a book on it too. I'm actually I actually bought a book about um Mohammed bin Salam recently. Is that his name right? MBS Mohammed bin Salam. Um I recently booked a book book I recently bought a book on him via Amazon. I think it's called Blood Money or something. I'm really interested to find out a little bit more about that guy and his background and whatnot. But anyway in Saudi Arabia, they've got this festival which they put on, I think, last year, if I'm not mistaken, where they invited a bunch of influencers and shit to go there. You know, every everyone that was basically lacking in morals and ethics decided to go over to cash a check and come back and keep it moving, which, you know, whatever the hell. Who cares? Uh, but I guess on the, off the back of plague graves, off the back of the, the pandemic, off the back of people mobilizing and being a little bit more socially aware and all that good stuff, I think it must be a little bit disappointing and disconcerting from some fans of Jeff Mills um, to see that he basically decided to go there for the check and put his morals and ethics to one side. And I have to say, I don't give a fuck. I really don't. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm on a tip now, especially off the back of a Virgil's untimely passing, and considering how some people act and basically respond when it comes to people from marginalized communities when they ended up doing faux pas vis a vis the Caucasian types who do many many a faux pas and never get called out by the flipping media publications, by the press, by the fans overall. I just not having it. I don't care. Let Jeff Mills go to Saudi Arabia and pick up his check. Let him go and dance in a fucking hula hoop that's on the floor and shit in terms of social distancing and do what he needs to do. Let him do it. I really don't care. You have the right as a fan to be disappointed in him if you legitimately thought that he was an ally, if you legitimately thought that your political um, and ideological leanings were somewhat aligned and he disappointed you in some way. Cool, feel disappointed. But I don't want anyone to kind of try and call him out on his name and to say that he's not ethical, to say he's not lacking in morals like in principles and ethics and whatnot because we can probably list a number of people within the community especially on techno twitter especially no no especially within the business techno scene who have got away with absolute murder throughout the last what 18 months or so maybe longer um absolutely shown themselves up especially djs on techno twitter man the, the, the moment these guys don't have gigs and they have to actually talk and interact and speak about the world you start to realize that jesus christ man you guys are dummies isn't it that's why for the most part i just listen to the mixes i tune i listen to the tunes i try and keep my myself at this arm's distance i do have a tendency to sometimes get involved and send dms that i probably shouldn't be sending but for the most part i try and keep these people at an arm distance because they are fucking fools once you start talking to them so again i understand the disappointment i get it being upset with him but whatever and it is what it is so i guess one guy here he tweeted that he was upset about um, jeff was taking on the festival or being part of it on the lineup he posted here um sure there's no objective morality and all but if you like money so much that you take it from a government that kills journalists and has the death penalty for being gay, you really should ask yourself some serious questions, which of course you should. If you're somebody that you pride yourself on being a techno DJ, if you pride yourself on representing marginalized people or people that don't have a voice, you think techno is um, inherently political, you think that you can you know, heal the world through your mixes and through your blends, um, you think that the art that you create because of its kind of humble working class origins has the ability to change the way people are viewed change the narrative on things all these good things if you believe that i 100 percent know why you're disappointed but again jeff mills is a techno pioneer jeff mills is one of the last of the last mohicans when it comes to being a prominent black dj in that space that's doing the damn business still at that level and i'm going to protect that man until the cows go home i saw him recently at fabric he absolutely slayed um i didn't like the fact that he was you know being chaperoned around with a little harem of 
flipping of flipping them um, staff that were basically preventing him from interacting with fans and stuff but i don't also think he's a guy that's going to be hugging you and shit so whatever but still he's a god amongst men it is what it is we continue um, and then he posts the flyer of all the djs playing and of course the people that you would basically recognize will be there adam Bayer, um who was who was fucking on the flipping playgrave circuit super hard during covid man remember he he did not let up which i don't blame him too he's got you know two kids um a wife who looks like she likes expensive things you just have to keep it moving in it um afro jack alesso Emily lens of course the lady that's crying on the beach about was it her right that was crying no it was that piggy Goo. no that was Emily lens right she was crying about straws being left in the beach but then also willing to travel hundreds and thousands of miles to go and play fucking play graves essentially in the middle of a pandemic especially at the heat at the peak of the pandemic she was still playing these play graves with no real sense of um hypocrisy none whatsoever just going there and doing her thing so again if you want to cuss um jeff mills i want you to bring the same energy to a media lens like fuck it i'm not i'm not for that um axwell but yeah loads of edm guys carl cox of course is there he was preaching loads of nonsense about people getting vaccinated and all that sort of stuff and now he is essentially taking the blood money and you know if you want to look at it that way from the saudi government me myself i don't i won't really care too tough but you know let's just call out the the hypocrisy um when it comes to that thing um who else you got here you got Carl Cox, you got Charlotte DeWitt, of course. All the standard business techno lot are there. David Getter, Dead Mouse, David Getter, of course, coming off the back of healing and f fucking solving racism in America. Cool to see. DJ Snake, Dubfire, oh, Dubfire. He had a lot to say about Playgraves, a lot to say about politics on that DJs and beer show. To see him going to Saudi Arabia and picking up that check is very interesting. Interesting to see what he had to Again, I would be interested to hear what these guys have to say about their... Hmm, about the optics of it about how comfortable again at the end of the day money talks isn't it if these guys are getting paid what we think they're getting paid anywhere between 10 grand to 50 grand per set it's going to be very tempting off the back of the pandemic off the back of your earning potential being halved or maybe being quartered and again you've got your still got the same expenses but now you're not able to kind of meet them because you're not playing out as much because I know if I'm not playing out as much on my shitty level, I can only imagine some of the bigger DJs just also slow down for them because all the places that they'd want to play, not all of them are open. So it limits your pool of where you can play. And if, if you're a promoter worth your salt, you're not going to want to oversaturate the same person in the same market because there's going to become fatigue and no one's going to come to the event, which means you're not going to be able to make money, which means you're going to be able to pay the DJs. So you're going to need to kind of, you know, mix it up a little bit, but there's, you can't you can only mix up to a certain extent depending on your laws of the country you live in in terms of covid and entry da, 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 da. so it's a weird place to be but i'd love it if these guys would actually reply and answer questions from some people that are not fans of you know these guys going to dj these, these at these places and just answer like why are you doing it why do you think that's an ethically good thing to do um considering as well most of these people still earn good money anyway outside it's not like this is going to be a make or break earner but again like why do you do that why 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 um loco dice da, 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 da. anyway this next week what do you say um he said expected this from many of the people in this list but it's actually really crazy to see some other names on here whom i strangely enough expected better much better part two of the insanity it continues on in case you news on this entry this is a festival that's spun to finance by the saudi government as a pr stunt yeah cool and then of course jeff mills reply to all this backlash on his facebook because he's a boomer it makes complete sense <laughs> but let's read it anyway jeff mills the goat um, what do you have to say about it? How did he push back? Let's see if it loads. Come on, you absolute muppet. What's wrong with my computer? Okay, cool. Let's refresh it again one more. I fucking hate Facebook, man. It's an absolutely terrible app. Um, I download, I deleted my first account where I had like 5,000 people on there, which I would kind of regret because I had met, if most of the people I had on there were people that I met on my travels, um, you know, cruising around the world and whatnot. And now I don't have any communication or contact with them whatsoever. Oh, what? Did he get deleted, that post? Maybe he got deleted. Did he delete his response? oh no yeah he deleted it, it looks like damn it he deleted his response well anyway he did reply i don't know what i forgot what he said maybe i can get a party on my twitter actually let me see if i can get his response up on there that's a shame isn't it i wanted to speak about that actually but it looks like jeff mills might have deleted that post what did he say what was his response uh oh he did make a response 
So I've got it here, cool. So his response, Chef Mills, is the following. Regarding Saudi Arabia Sandstorm Festival, hello, now that some of you have had some chance to read the reasoning for why I'm accepting the invitation to go to Saudi Arabia, um, I've had time to read your replies and a level of your comments. Um, I won't get into the melodramatic fireworks, but instead jump right to the point. By now, in the political events that have happened in the world over the last six years, most of you should know that it's senseless to judge citizens uh, by the actions of their government. Oh, he's doing that. Oh, I don't like when people do that sort of stuff. Like, you know, I'm playing for the people. I'm not playing for the government. Don't do that defense. Just say you're going to go pick up a check. It's dark times out there. You've not been able to play as much as you wanted to because of the pandemic. They're offering you a crazy bag that's going to make up for all the missing gigs you've had this year. It is what it is. Just say that in it. There's no need to lie and talk about you or you're there for the Saudi Arabian people. Like, come on, man. You niggas don't give a shit about the Saudi Arabian people. Let's keep it a B. Um, it says here the same applies to judging an audience by the actions of the promoter or the organizer if that were the case the world would have been cut off diplomatic relations <laughs> what my g jeff mills is spinning this hard but i'm gonna back him i don't care you know what i mean black people protect black people um cut off diplomatic relations and isolated america during the whole trump presidency banished all chinese citizens here or russia's for both of the government's human rights crimes and all cuban people um, would be categorized as fascists but we do not because we know the difference yes the saudi arabian government and the conditions that they impose are primitive and violent and abusive and just out far right evil but it shouldn't cloud so because of so basically by his logic he'd go and play in north korea too in it of course they would think about it someone like a fucking what's her name nastia right she was all out there plucking plague rigging all over the place you know um what's his face as well who was another culprit like just playing in every place not giving a shit about what's going on in the world the world is on fire but these guys were performing all day long um some of them even moved in it who moved to colombia i forgot some tech house people moved to colombia didn't they or was it cuba colombia was it bali some of them moved over there and just like we're just getting fucked up playing in shitty bars and whatnot living the life um, but some of those guys, they, they love money a lot. Or they, they, it's either they love money or the dopamine hit that you get from being a DJ at that level is just so addictive. It's better than any drug. And you just need more of it. Having the adoration and the crowd be wanting you and asking you to play longer, the promoters kissing your ass. Like it just must be so um it must be just so addictive you just can't let it go you just want more you want more you want more anyway continue <gasps> da, 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 da. he spoke about trump anyway. um yes the saudi government's evil and they kill people and they chuck gays off of buildings but no he didn't say that and um, they said that they shouldn't cloud the idea in question and um, why some there think that by having a, such a large event and inviting these to play in unrestricted might make some difference most of you can probably remember a time or occasion in your past when you first realized the power of music and you're reading this is likely to happen while it does look <laughs> come on jeff man just say they're paying you money they backed up the brinks truck to your crib they unloaded it all on your floor and you're like, huh? This is actually all in dollars, American dollars. I said, yes, sir. We want you to come play in our country, right? And then you went. It's no big deal. What makes you think an event in SA would be any different or South Africa or South America? I think. In fact, there was a place where the people might need to be mentally escaped and Saudi Arabia dance floors would be different than yours or is that what you want? Perhaps DJs in Saudi Arabia isn't really what some people are upset about. Maybe it's something else. If it's about the money DJs are earning, it's because, it's because SA is a wealthy country for the petrol world uses. They can afford to pay more because they have it. And if you have a problem with professional DJs earning money, then that's an issue of a wider, deeper personal problem that live career coach might possibly be of help. Oh, so he's saying that. Oh, okay, Jeff, I'm still backing you, but off, mate. Off. This is this is this is not the best defense, my guy. Um, you better off of just being honest about your intentions, about your reasoning. Again, either you don't explain yourself, which you don't, shouldn't have, because it's your money and it's your job and it's your career and you're a fucking adult. You shouldn't explain yourself to anybody. Or if you do explain yourself, you just say up front, "I'm doing it for the bag." This whole like um combativeness pushing and insulting of the fan or the reader is a bit gross because these guys who are complaining i would imagine are legitimate jeff mills fans right they love the guy they love techno they've been supporters they buy his stuff like jeremy you know I mean? they basically support his career the entire time and they again it was naive of them to think that but they generally believe that they were ideologically matched or you know connected or they had similar ideas or views and society and politics right they generally thought that and of course they're disappointed now that he's doing something that doesn't necessarily vibe with them get it but you know 
again, we back in Jeff Mills, Jeff Mills Club all the way to the end. It continues here, it says, um, here's the most important part of the letter. There are people in Saudi Arabia right now that are in a desperate need, suffering, afraid, isolated, victimized, traumatized, abused, and have been killed for what they believe in. Some of you seem to think that it's a good idea for international DJs to boycott and not go, which would further isolate young people there. <sighs> okay. That all of us in electronic dance music don't care about them if this is their problem. I'm positive there isn't a single DJ booked for this event that agrees with Saudi Arabia's government. Yes, I, I definitely think there is, mate. Honestly, DJs are, the, are a weird bunch, mate. If you've listened to any people speak online, especially on Twitter, when they actually have time to speak and say their opinions, like, you know, they're legitimate adult babies. You know what I mean? Like, they have some very infantile views on society and the world at large, which is why I don't follow most of them. I just kind of use, you know, uh, Twitter for this actual use which is to you know talk about fashion and you know complain about football and dip into the world of black Twitter but when it comes to DJ talk honestly those guys are mad I wouldn't be surprised if some of them legitimately think what they're doing in Saudi Arabia is you know is um humane is kind of justice along the way doesn't you know what I mean uh, they've got some weird opinions anyway I'm positive there's no single DJ booked on an event who agrees with Saudi Arabia's government and what they're doing, but yet some try to connect DJs as if they're somehow complicit. That's outrageous, but hey, it's social media, anything goes. Until we fact check, right? There can be an isolation or a dialogue, both are proven to be affected. I know it's a holiday fun to accuse people, to portray people like they have no morals and making earning and money. The only reason they accept a play, which is the only reason they accept a play. Why else would you play there? Legitimately, I think I said at that time, what the whole playground things was happening some of these guys that didn't even need a crap as those people if you would have offered them a bag and told them to come and dj on the, on your fucking controller on your laptop in your living room they'd probably come they didn't have any you know what i mean they were just guns for hire whatever it continues next um but most of you know that's not true a lot of you have seen otherwise over the centuries over the decades while some of you are just for infants while some of you are just fast at work and making sandstorm event memes, I only ask that you don't forget to mention the real victims of all this, which are the citizens. <laughs> Yo, this is epic spin, man. This guy is a spin master, which makes sense because he's a sick DJ. Get it? Huh? Corny. Anyway, um, use the platform wisely. Spread the word of what's going on over there. I don't know if there's any, or if there, I don't know if there any. I, sorry, I don't know if any of these words will make some of you understand the meaning of this but then they're not all the same anyway welcome to planet earth everyone else please take care have a nice have a healthy holiday and go fuck yourself no you didn't say that best regards to jeff mills anyways look he's going there for the money he's going there for the bag it is what it is you know at the end of the day like i said beforehand i don't necessarily give a shit um i don't really look at my artist as um um my kind of beacons or my standard that i'm going to view or that i'm going to frame or cultivate my whole world view and political view and whatnot that's not the place that they occupy maybe they might make a tune on anthem that might inspire me to do certain things but in terms of informing my political views i try and do that on my own i try and do that through living i try and do that through learning but i also try and not do that through djs i mean that's just not the right way to go about things i understand if you're a fan of his you're disappointed because you thought you were aligned you're obviously not now it's up to you as a fan what do you do if you don't align with him you just don't support his stuff and you just keep it moving but this constant insulting of people and getting up them whatnot is nonsense he read a whole lot of fluff there really the reason why he's going is because of the money we all know that we're all adults it is what it is let's just all you know move on and whatever it may be is it be the people on that list for the most part with the exception of jeff mills are never going to come out and explain themselves because the truth is they're going for the money the morals can go to one side and it is what it is but i just don't want to see i just want to see the same energy that's given to jeff mills given to see other people if you're going to attack Jeff Mills, please attack fucking, not please attack, but also scrutinize the people like Amelia Lenz who are, you know, on a beach crying about turtles getting flipping, you know, straws getting poked up their nose, but then they're happy to, again, fly thousands of miles to DJ somewhere during the height of the pandemic and essentially kill, you know, many, many, many grandparents off the back of it. Again, I'm not too sure if that's true. Allegedly, who knows offhand it could be, but, you know, what can you do? What can you do? What can you do? What can you do? Let's move on. Next on the list here, we've got Epic News, courtesy of Supreme. They have collaborated with Double Taps, Double Taps, legendary brand helmed by Tetsu Nishiyama, a brand that I've been obsessed with. I've got so many lookbooks and magazine prints and scans and cutouts from old school or W Taps um, collections. I think I might have a couple of BDUs that don't fit me anymore still in my collection. I might have a couple of shirts in my collection, but Double Taps is one of those legendary brands that just keeps doing its thing 
behind the scenes steady steady eddie not really ruffling any feathers they've usually got some of the best collaborations when it comes to vans and just make some great shit and it looks like they're collaborating now with supreme the text is the follows uh, the text is the following sorry supreme has worked with double taps on a new collection for the fall 2021 the collection consists of two jackets a vest a jersey a hooded sweatshirt a crew neck a t-shirt and incense holder and incense is available on december the second so it's coming up very very soon and here's some images of the items which look absolutely frighteningly banging like legitimately banging they look so fucking good hopefully this loads in time because my computer is going crazy is it going to load maybe not Okay, I'll have to refresh this. Bear with me one second. Let me hit the refresh button. Let me hit the refresh button. Hopefully it works. Yeah, there we go. Cool. We got it. So we already got this amazing, extremely, in the words of ASAP Yams, cozy as fuck um, fur hoodie thing. That was like a bomber jacket. It's absolutely amazing. It looks so, so, so good. And I think it also comes in black, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just double check here. I think it comes in black. Ooh. Come on, hurry up. Load. This fucking computer is just not having it today, innit? it? It's not having it, mate. Yep. And then they've got this amazing vest as well that looks a little bit like a bulletproof vest, but it's just probably a down vest, like a standard one that you put over a jacket or under a jacket, but it looks fucking cool. Obviously, a matching beanie as well with the logo from Double Tap. It's just great shit, man very well and subtly done there's a lot of collaborations this year it feels like when it comes to supreme i wonder if this is a consequence or a natural sort of reaction oh yeah or a natural consequence of all the investment they've taken on the last few years oh that varsity jacket is so hard are you insane what does that say on the back of it bombers and it's got a picture of a, an illustration of a snake going through an apple that's also got teeth and eyes yo that jacket is hard the bandana also comes in it because I think Tetsu was always wearing bandanas of some sort. So I'm sure that's part of the reason why he put that in there. But that varsity jacket is harder than hard. If you listen to it via audio, it's essentially a by a, a varsity jacket again with red sleeves, blood red sleeves. It feels like a black body with um, the massive embroidery that kind of covers the entire back. Again, like a snake um, running its course around in through a apple that's also got eyes and teeth and bombers written on the back of the jacket in some sort of graffiti hand style print. <clears throat> so good, man. Let's see the next one. Oh, this page is still in take loads. It takes ages to load though because my computer is just jacky shit. Next three. Bear with me again. My computer, my computer. I always complain about this computer. I just need to get a new one. Get a new MacBook or something just to kind of spruce up my uh, ability to stream and whatnot. It's not loading. Is it going to load? Okay, let's go to the next one. There you go. Hopefully it loads now. Yeah, they've got the first jacket in the front. Oh, it looks so good. It says Double Tap Supreme at the front. This is definitely going to be something that sells out. You can definitely see that. It'll definitely go up. What's the last collaboration they did together? Was that the one with the red and navy jacket, right? Never red and navy varsity jacket that came out. I'm, I'm going to say 2017 or 2014. When did that jacket come out? 2017, 2014. Supreme. Double Taps. Varsity, let's see when that came out. Uh, yeah, there, there we go. Got it here. This one, remember this? If you can see that on the screen, do you remember that? Do you remember that one? That was, I think that might have been the last collection they did together collaboration. But that Varsity jacket looks so so good, man. Yes, everyone's got braids too. I need to get my hair braided. I need to get some cornrows. I need to also tap into my strength. Oh man, that Varsity jacket. They know that they know that Varsity jacket is hard. They're showing a lot of that. So 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 good. <clears throat> oh, this is on here. Oh, this is too many images. Forty four. Can't I just show the whole thing without having to do this way. Which is annoying, you know. But anyway, this is. I think I'm gonna leave it there for the time being. But yeah, you get the drift. Um, loads of great stuff in this collection. Um, I'm sure most of it is going to end up going to be a sell. It's going to end up selling out. People are going to be fighting over it. The resale prices are going to be crazy, probably because the, the retail is going to be crazy on it too. Um, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. But yeah, good shit all around. Great little hats as well they've got included there. Nice jumpers. But yeah, good shit from Supreme as per usual. No surprise on that one. Um, and I think 
that might be it for the show right now. Excellent Sticker Show episode number 523. It's been an absolute pleasure, right? Hasn't it? It's been a pleasure to have your company. I'm really not going to lie about that. Um, it's been great. It's been fun. We've danced. We've sung. We've done the absolute bees and ears. And I'm hoping going forward, we can continue to link and build. It's going to take some time to get used to such a thing. But I hope we can do so going forward. I really do hope we can do so going forward. But yeah, that's it, man. Excellent Single Show, episode number 523. Thanks again for tuning in. As I mentioned previously, loads of stuff coming up soon, very soon. Got live mixes, I believe, hopefully coming at the end of this week. I also have a live stream podcast coming for the UFC 269 card. So if you're interested in that, check that out soon. I'll be doing more random shows about content concerning the LA comedy scene because obviously people really seem to enjoy that and I seem to get a lot of good responses from it. But it does kill me to do such a thing because it kills my brain cells to hear those guys talk. But hey, if the people like it, I'll just keep serving them what they like. And apart from that, yeah, that's it really. Check out my site, axonzinger.com for more information on the projects I'm doing. I have links to my blog, links to my DJ page, links to my photography that I'm going to be updating as well, that page, because I'm going to get some new roles of film developed. All those things you can find on my website, which is agassinozinger.com. More information regarding myself on there. Uh, but until then, guys, I'll see you very, very soon. If you listen via the podcast, as per usual, if you listen via the podcast, as the audio version, you should hear an outro song, a song that I've selected this week. I'm doing them from all the podcasts going forward because it's quite nice to hear like a little outro on the way out. But if you're listening or watching, sorry, via YouTube, this is the end. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company, and I'll see you guys again very soon. Peace out. <laughs>